cruel and hard, greedy and violent. Once the scourge of civilized nations, they have captured a role in our mythology as the very incarnation of unholy terror prowling the seven seas. What little we know of pirates is a tantalizing mixture of fact and fiction, like the treasure they jealously guarded, the truth, until recently, has remained hidden. Contrary to their reputation as bloodthirsty tyrants, most pirate captains were in fact elected by crews that embraced a primitive form of democracy. Captured spoils were divided according to contract, and theft between shipmates drew swift punishment. In a time when some men were bought and sold like cattle, piracy offered an escape from the living hell of slavery. These and other revelations are only now coming to light as scientists, archaeologists, and treasure hunters add new pages to the hidden history of pirates. A heavily armed sloop bearing a king's ransom in gold, making her way swiftly through warm currents to a tropical island. That's what you expect when you hear the word pirates, huh? We'd like to set a fresh course and take you on a different journey. I'm Bob Colonna. Join me as we sail the coast of New England and discover the untold story of the rogues who once plied these waters. No, we won't see any palm trees or parrots or peg legs, but we will find adventure, intrigue, and perhaps a bit of treasure. June 15th, 1699. Narragansett Bay provides a safe refuge for the notorious Captain William Kidd. Notified of his arrival, the authorities attempt to seize Kidd's vessel, but the King's agents are quickly convinced that rowing back to Newport is the wiser course of action. The gentleman pirate pays a visit to Captain Thomas Payne, a former shipmate living in Jamestown. Rumors soon spread that Kidd has entrusted his old friend with a large quantity of gold. People have looked for Kidd's treasure here since just about the beginning. In the 1930s, the government sent out a team with early metal detectors and went over the place. All they found was old horseshoe nails, and old horseshoes, and bits of plows and stuff like that, no gold. Soon after his visit, Kidd is arrested and transported to London for trial. His wife, Sarah, sends a letter to Captain Payne asking him for 24 ounces of gold. Keep all the rest you have in custody, she writes, for it is all we have to support us in time of want. Unfortunately for Captain Kidd, his wife's letter falls into the hands of the authorities. The information inflames the suspicions of a 17th century conspiracy theorist known as the Earl of Bellamont. Your Lordships, I recommend the perusal of the evidence I enclose that will inform you of the strange approval given to pirates by the government and people of Rhode Island. You will find an inventory of gold and jewels in the hands of Governor Cranston, which he took from a pirate. We have also found a letter from Captain Kidd's wife to Thomas Paine asking for 24 ounces of gold left there by Kidd, a plain indication that there was a good deal of treasure left behind. Captain Paine's home in Jamestown is searched, but no trace of Kidd's gold is found. And if it still exists, the current residents of the estate have yet to find it. Oh, at least once a month somebody asks me, have you found Kid's treasure yet? All we ever find are horseshoes, nails, broken pottery, basically garbage left over from the 18th century. In the days when there were few standing navies, governments sometimes employed privately owned ships to engage in warfare at sea. Known as privateers, they were authorized to attack enemy nations. But when a tempting prize appeared on the horizon, Regardless of its nationality, both rules and riggings were often torn to shreds. It was said that in the early 1700s, nearly every able-bodied seaman in Newport was engaged in privateering. The most notorious was a man named Thomas Tew, 
Give fire! The authorities in Boston had denied Captain Tew's request for a privateering commission. But in Rhode Island, the payment of 500 English pounds cut through the red tape and Tew set sail for the Far East. There his sloop, Amity, spotted the flagship of the Great Mogul of India. A grand ship! A fierce battle ensued, but the defenders were no match for the privateers. Tew was delighted to find the ship crammed with rich silks, ivory, diamonds, and gold. He set course for America and the safety of Newport, Rhode Island. According to one report, all the residents, except a few pulpit-pounding clergymen, hailed Tew as a triumphant hero. The captain and crew quickly spread their wealth through the taverns and bordellos of the city by the sea. Tew's enthusiastic reception bolstered the accusation made by the King Surveyor General of Customs that Rhode Island had become the chief refuge of pirates. That disreputable distinction would spell doom for certain less fortunate entrepreneurs. In 1723, the crew of the pirate sloop Ranger made the fatal mistake of firing upon his majesty's ship Greyhound. Once captured, their lives were swiftly swept away, victims to an ebbing tide of royal patience with colonial piracy. The Crown pointedly assigned William Dummer, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, to preside over a court of admiralty in Newport. John Valentine, Advocate General for the King, denounced the suspects with a fiery eloquence that echoes through the centuries. These sort of criminals are engaged in a perpetual war with every individual, with every state, Christian or infidel. They have no country, but by the nature of their guilt, separate themselves, renouncing the benefit of all lawful society to commit these heinous crimes. The Romans, therefore, justly styled them hostes humani generis, enemies of mankind. For the honor and reputation of this colony, though of late scandalously reproached to have favored pirates, such nefarious persons shall find as much justice in Rhode Island as in any other part of His Majesty's dominions. 26 members of the crew were found guilty. They were sentenced to be hanged in public and then buried between the high and low water marks on Goat Island. Among them was 21-year-old John Fitzgerald of County Limerick, Ireland. While in Newport's jail awaiting execution, he composed a poem lamenting his folly. "'Twas in youthful blooming years when I that practice took of perpetrating piracy and for filthy gain did look. To wickedness we all were bent, our lusts for to fulfill. To rob at sea was our intent, and perpetrate all ill. I pray the Lord preserve you, and keep you from this end. Oh, let Fitzgerald's great downfall unto your welfare tend. The Hidden History of Pirates will continue after these messages. For centuries, evidence from the golden age of piracy lay buried beneath the waves, until the day a daring explorer found the wreck of a pirate ship off Cape Cod, a ship once under the command of the notorious Black Sam Bellamy. I am a free prince, and I have as much authority to make war on the whole world as he who has a hundred ships at sea. Bellamy was known as the Orator, because he loved to regale his victims with such fiery speeches. In 1717, his ship, the Widda Galley, was caught in a violent storm and sank off the coast of Cape Cod. The legendary fortune in gold and silver that Bellamy took to his watery grave became part of local folklore and sparked the imagination of a young boy who vowed to find the treasure. I came across an old map 
and on the map it said the place where the pirate ship Witta sank. Um, 102 men drowned. And then I found the documents that were associated with the map. But gathering the scattered clues that would narrow the search for the Wida was just the beginning for Barry Clifford. Ahead lay the exhausting task of searching miles of ocean floor to pinpoint the exact location of the wreck. You know, I don't think I slept a lot. It was a terrible time for me. You had to think every night when you came home, maybe all these people are right. and Maybe we are crazy. Maybe there really isn't a shipwreck out there and that there's, you know, we're just a bunch of lunatics. After months of scouring the search area, funds for the expedition were all but exhausted. Just when all hope seemed lost, divers located a ship's cannon, a handful of Spanish coins, and an array of 18th century artifacts. I think we might have a shipwreck here. <laughs> Barry Clifford's lifelong quest had been realized, and news of the amazing discovery flashed across the country. More than 250 years ago, a pirate ship sank in a storm off Cape Cod and disappeared along with a treasure that could be worth $400 million. Tonight, that ship has been found. This is the only documented pirate ship, uh, pirate treasure that's ever been found. So I guess I'm in a sort of unique situation to having crossed the line really from fantasy to reality. Artifacts, navigational equipment, gold and silver coins have been recovered from the site. An elegant flintlock pistol, perhaps worn by Black Sam himself, was painstakingly freed from marine deposits that had held it captive for centuries. For us, people set eyes on a pirate ship. For me, it was like a time machine, because I knew that I was the first person to be looking at these items since 1717. And the last people to touch them were real pirates. Not Hollywood pirates, real pirates. But some skeptics still doubted that a motley crew of amateurs and volunteers had become the first to discover the wreck of an authentic pirate ship. It just seems like in almost anything that you do, you know, you have a, a whole sort of um, you know, coliseum of people wanting you to be gobbled up by the lions, you know. It would take almost a year for Clifford to locate his holy grail and silence the critics. While digging on one of the, the magnetometer hits, we came across a ship's bell. Now, when you're trying to identify a shipwreck, that is without a doubt the most important clue. To pin down the identity of a ship is to find the ship's bell, which has the name of the ship right on it. Thousands of artifacts have been recovered from the wreck of the Widda Galley. Many have been put on public display in a Provincetown museum. The exhibit attracts throngs of curious patrons, eager for a look at genuine pirate treasure. But the real value of this discovery cannot be weighed in Spanish coins. Priceless information gleaned from the Widda and other sources is leading historians to reconsider their view of pirates. In most cases, relieving merchant vessels of their cargo undoubtedly required a thundering broadside, the clash of steel, and a willingness to meet your customers face to face. But some experts now believe that the battle tactics of the buccaneers may have included as much psychological terror as brute force. Often the mere sight of the Jolly Roger was enough to encourage a targeted ship to surrender. And while there is little doubt that members of a captured vessel were often forced to join a pirate crew, some did so willingly. Reluctant sailors who had tasted the harsh discipline of the Royal Navy could be persuaded to choose a new way of life, free of class distinctions and filled with opportunity. And they were not alone. There is increasing evidence that many pirates were former African slaves. Some had escaped from captivity. Others may have been freed by pirate gangs seeking strong backs and stout hearts without regard for the color of a man's skin. As strange as it seems, in the 17th century, pirate ships may have been one of the few strongholds of democracy. In the heat of battle, orders had to be obeyed without question. But the charismatic leaders of most pirate ships had attained their rank after being elected by their men. 
scholars have studied the Articles of Agreement that many pirate crews adopted. These documents reveal a more egalitarian arrangement than one might expect from these infamous enemies of mankind. The captain was allowed two shares of all captured goods, the quartermaster, one and a half, and ordinary seamen, a share each. A primitive form of workers' compensation ensured that men who had been injured in battle were given additional loot. As new information continues to be uncovered, we may find it necessary to change the way we think about pirates. Without denying the harsh reality of the profession, piracy was a way of life that can best be understood in its social and historical context. They were people. They were humans. They were trying to be free. And um, were they violent? Yeah, they were violent, but they were living in a very violent society. You know, they, there wasn't much hope. If you were on board a merchant ship or a slave ship, your life expectancy wasn't that long. Frankly, today, with the way we think, I think most Americans would have been pirates. The hidden history of pirates will continue. History tells us that the days of the pirates have long since faded into the mists of time. But some might argue that their daring trade was carried on by certain latter-day descendants. It wasn't long ago that these coves and harbors provided refuge for a different breed of buccaneer. A time when the ocean silence was shattered by gunfire and the waters of Narragansett Bay were mixed with bootleg whiskey and blood. Beginning in 1920, prohibition meant that the sale or transportation of alcohol was suddenly illegal throughout the United States. New England, like the rest of the nation, took part in this noble experiment. But enforcement here was bedeviled by a fleet of ships waiting just offshore, loaded with contraband liquor. Protected by international waters, all they needed was a way to deliver their forbidden cargo to thirsty clients along the coast. That job was quickly filled by a mix of hard luck sailors and petty criminals who became known as rum runners. The kind of people who were attracted to rum running in the 20s were the kind of people that you'd want to hire for any kind of job. These were young, ambitious fishermen mostly, people who knew about gear, about rigging, and about engines. By the end of the decade, the fine art of smashing booze bottles for reasons of ceremony or civic duty was in full swing. Efforts to staunch the flow of distilled spirits being smuggled ashore, however, were proving more troublesome. First of all, you have to understand how high the stakes were. Uh, a rum runner would take in a load of 350 crates, cases of rum. Running it back and forth from the ship to the shore, the runner himself might get $700 to $800. That was more than a year's pay. Many a crafty fisherman, feeling the sting of hard economic times, applied his nautical skills to the dangerous game of dodging patrol boats. You're dealing now with people who, as fishermen, knew the area really well, much better than the uh, government um, revenue agents. Frustrated law enforcers became the object of ridicule. While the rum runners eluded them, the Coast Guard mistakenly fired on the Commodore of the New York Yacht Club as he sailed into Newport to meet the Prince of Sweden. No one was injured in that incident, but it foreshadowed a bloody confrontation that would ignite a national controversy. Exactly what happened in the early morning hours of December 29, 1929, is still hotly disputed. But this much is known. A Coast Guard patrol spied a notorious rum-running vessel, the Black Duck, cautiously entering Narragansett Bay. A searchlight revealed that her deck was loaded with almost 400 cases of liquor. When the echo of machine gun fire faded, three crew members of the Black Duck lay dead and another wounded. The Coast Guard reported that the rum runners had unexpectedly swerved into a volley of warning shots, but the sole survivor claimed it was a cold-hearted ambush whether they meant to scare the crew or whether they actually meant they were just frustrated and meant to shoot them. The result was that the entire 
crew was killed, except for young Charlie Travers, who was a very popular figure on the Newport waterfront who lost one finger in the, uh, the melee. The killings sent shockwaves across the country and sparked renewed debate in Congress over the wisdom of prohibition. A Los Angeles Times editorial said, quote, the Coast Guard talked the only language smugglers and pirates have ever understood. But a federal grand jury in Providence refused to indict the surviving crew member. I think the fact that Rhode Island, and specifically Rhode Island, had such a tradition of independence and its long history of privateering and piracy added to the sense that a certain kind of lawlessness at sea was not just tolerated but celebrated. In 1930, Rhode Island voted to support the repeal of prohibition. For many, the freedom to buy alcoholic beverage was cause for celebration. But it meant that the rum runners, common criminals to some, but folk heroes to others, were permanently out of business. It was the end of an era and marked a return to more traditional uses for the hidden coves and quiet harbors of Narragansett Bay. The Hidden History of Pirates will continue. They vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there's only this difference. They rob the poor under cover of the law, while we plunder the rich under protection of our own courage. That was Captain Bellamy's definition of piracy. Best taken, to be sure, with a few grains of salt. Our own understanding of these free princes of the high seas continues to change. But while there is no doubt that they caused much mayhem and misery, our continued fascination with their exploits is strong evidence. Evidence that there may be just a touch of the pirate in almost everyone. This is Bob Colonna. Thank you for joining us.